everybody. Thanks for coming to the Rough Pet. Glad to see you here. We have our newest uh, faculty member uh, associated with the IOE talking today, Amy Trowbridge. So really looking forward to hearing about her research. Amy got her PhD at the University of Colorado, and then she was an NSF postdoctoral fellow at uh, Indiana. And uh, she works on, she's a chemical ecologist, and she works on feedbacks between plants in the atmosphere. And her study areas go everywhere from the Amazon to uh, conifer forests in the western US. So I'll turn it over to Amy. Thanks for. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Kathy, and thanks everyone for coming. So um, it's really my pleasure to share some of the work that I've been doing over the past two years with you today. Um, many of you already know a little bit about me and probably think that I've just been gallivanting around Europe for two to three years, which is partially true. But um, I've also been juggling and um, involved in a, in a number of different projects, and I'm going to talk a couple of those with you today. So I'd like to start by just acknowledging um, my funding sources, as well as this really fabulous group of um, collaborators and, and friends. Um, so as Kathy mentioned, I've been on an NSF postdoc fellowship for the past two years, and um, we were also lucky enough to get funded by the Department of Energy. And through those two grants, um, working with three different postdoc advisors, so sometimes people think one postdoc advisor is enough, but <laughs> you have to get, um, you know, bossed around by three. So, um, but no, but these are really great guys. Um, I work with Rich Phillips and Phil Stevens, who are both at Indiana University, and Yogi Schnitzler, who's the head of the Environmental Simulation Unit um, at the Helmholtz Centrum in Munich. And also involved in this DOE project is my partner, Paul Stoy. And so he will tell you it's been really fun, but maybe also a little challenging. Um, so we've been working together on this project, looking at soil VOCs and atmospheric chemistry. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I've done with Yogi, but the rest is a little tangential to the title of the talk. So that's for another time. Uh, and then I also just want to thank Ken Rafa. He has just been um, a really great resource and mentor to me. He's at the University of Wisconsin, and he's the one who got me pulled into this Ponderosa project that I'm going to talk a lot about today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Nate McDowell and Henry Adams. They're at, well, Nate's at Los Alamos National Lab, and Henry is now a new faculty at Oklahoma State. But um, when he was a postdoc with Nate, we started talking about these ideas of defense mechanisms and how to incorporate them into tree mortality frameworks. And um, they kind of got on board with me and have let me work at their experimental site for the past few years, which has been really fun. And along those lines, I want to thank David Weaver and Megan Hoffman. Um, they've been invaluable to getting the data. Um, they've been helping with the GC work and analyzing all these samples. And so I'm going to show you the results from that work today. And then a slew of other people um, without which we wouldn't be getting this funding or any of the results. So. Um, with that, I'm just going to kind of talk about first my broad interest, which is as a chemical ecologist, I'm interested in secondary metabolites. Um, so these compounds are thought to not really play a primary role in growth and reproduction, but they indirectly affect these processes uh, quite strongly. And I'm interested in secondary metabolites across a range of scales. So I really want to know what are these molecular and physiological controls over the synthesis and emissions of these compounds? How do these compounds then affect community level interactions? So how are they affecting um, interactions between different trophic levels? And then also, what are the implications for ecosystem processes? So how are they mediating interactions that are affecting ecosystems as a whole? So there are a number of different types or classes of secondary compounds. And the group that I'm most interested in are known as terpenes. And um, more specifically today, I'm going to focus a lot on monoterpenes. So I had this conversation with Ken Rafa. We were bonding over monoterpenes, as one does. And um, he was telling me that you know, at one point in his life, he had to make a decision between studying sulfur-containing compounds that smell like eggs or studying monoterpenes that smell like Christmas trees. And he decided on monoterpenes. And so I feel like I've kind of made a good decision. So I get to study Christmas, which is really fun. And um, so these compounds are 10 carbons. And um, they're synthesized primarily in the chloroplast. 
Um, and they can have, well, they can be influenced by a number of different variables. And so um, we know that herbivores can influence synthesis and emission. We know that the low ground um, organisms and processes can influence them, as well as climate. And then in turn, we know that these emissions also have feedbacks on herbivores, below ground processes, and climate. And so there are a lot of feedbacks mediated by these compounds. And so for me and other chemical ecologists, we find it really important to understand how carbon is being allocated to them under these various environmental and biotic stresses. OK. So, as I've kind of alluded to, the fact that there are a lot of factors to disentangle when we're considering effects on chemical defense. And so if we map them onto this poor little tree here, we can see that things get complicated really quickly. And this is actually a very simplified version <laughs> of feedbacks. And so um, what I'm really highlighting here is these, with these blue arrows, these are interactions that I'm interested in and I've been studying in other projects that I'm involved in, but I'm not going to talk about today. And the gray arrows are the interactions that I'm going to discuss today in the context of three different projects that I'm, I'm working on. And um, in the spirit of the rough cut, one of these projects is pretty much done. This paper is uh, conditionally accepted with minor revisions. And the other two are ongoing projects where I'm going to show you a lot of preliminary data, ideas that we're having, and um, you know, future directions. So, OK. So let's start with this project that's pretty much done which is um, where we ask the question, how does ponderosa pine respond to simulated bark beetle attack? And so this is an issue that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, especially here in um, the western United States. So conifers um, can be, their tissues can be exploited by a number of different biotic agents, of which most people would agree that the mountain pine beetle is probably the one that poses the greatest threat. Um, in addition to the mountain pine beetle feeding on phloem, and severing transport within the tree, these guys also carry the spores of the blue stain fungus on their exoskeletons, which is then um, able to infect both the phloem and the sapwood and contributes to tree mortality in the system. And so both the beetle and the, fun and, and the fungus have um, selected for these really sophisticated sets of defenses uh, in their conifer host. Luckily for these conifers, they have this multifaceted defense strategy that consists of both physical and chemical defenses. So physical in the sense that the resin can block the entry for the beetles. They can entomb the beetles. Um, also histological, so you can see here some in the lower right, this necrotic um, lesion where we're actually confining biotic organisms and cutting off their nutrient supplies. Or chemical defenses, which include phenolics, monoterpenes, um, et cetera, and these can, um, you know, repel or impair or be, um, or eventually kill any type of, some of these organisms that are associated with um, conifers. And so under the chemical defense strategy, they come in two different flavors, constitutive and induced. And so constitutive, we like to think of as, you know, these compounds that are always ready for attack, having higher costs. And then there's these induced defenses that are only um, present when needed that tend to have lower costs, although people have mixed feelings about this. So, um, you know, like the resin ducts that store and transport these compounds, um, the constitutive and induced responses can be very dynamic and integrated. So, uh, what we talk about in terms of conifer defense, obviously, is mostly in terms of the resin. And this can be a physical and chemical defense. So the resin is mostly um, made up of monoterpenes and then diterpene acids and sesquiterpenes. And as you can see here, they have very different densities, um, but they also have a range of biotic activity as well. So we like to think of monoterpenes as being some of the more toxic compounds to these bark beetles. Um, diterpene acids tend to play a really complementary role in terms of their really strong antifungal uh, capabilities. And sesquiterpenes, to be completely honest, we have no idea what they do. And so <laughs> that's a really ripe area of research um, if anyone is interested. So um, like I said, if, if we're expecting an induced response and we can differ composition, then we can also expect possibly a change in toxicity, but also a change in the overall physical defense. So like I said, density is different. And so this may change the viscosity of the resin and have important implications for the bark beetle. <laughs> 
So um, as most of you know, most research on mountain pine beetle has been conducted on lodgepole. And this is because lodgepole is its historic and most common host. But as many of you also know, mountain pine beetle can affect a number of different conifer species, including ponderosa pine. And so given some of the outbreaks that we've been seeing in sections of Montana, western South Dakota, as well as um, along the front range of the Rocky Mountains, it's really been um, you know, necessitating us to look at this, this tree species as a potential resource for the, for the bark beetle. So this is a paper that came out of um, a group at Northern Arizona University. And they were suggesting that ponderosa pine has a limited response to mountain pine beetle and its associated fungi. And so at first we were like, well, maybe we shouldn't even do this study. But when you read the paper, they're really focusing mostly on resinosis as well as necrotic lesion. And they really weren't talking anything about the chemistry. And so there was this lack of chemical data. And we thought that that was an important gap to fill. And so that kind of led us to ask this question, which is, does ponderosa pine produce induced chemical defenses in response to wounding and inoculation with the mountain pine beetle fungus? And more specifically, can we expect this response to be local and or systemic, so throughout the tree and other portions of the tree? And can we expect physical as well as chemical changes? So can we expect changes in composition that would alter toxicity as well as viscosity? Um, and so what does one do to address this question but send your two-month-old child and husband to the field to do all your field work for you while you stay home and watch Puppy the Vampire Slayer. No, I'm just kidding. I was there. I was there. And, but we all really did go to the field together. <laughs> and um, this is Paul taking a DBH, a diameter at baby height, and um, his new metric that he is very proud of. And um, so what we did was me, Paul, and Sophie uh, hauled it out to um, a site near here in Montana. And we mechanically wounded 40 mature ponderosa pines using this little bore here. As you can see, this is our, our wounding right here. And, um, and so at the same time, we took a constitutive phloem sample. And then we inoculated half with the um, blue stain fungus that was generously donated by Diana Six at University of Montana. Um, then we plugged the hole, and we went on a trip to Colorado for two weeks. And then we came back, and we sampled the phloem again at the wounding site near the lesion, as well as on the opposite side of the tree in order to evaluate both local and systemic responses over time. I then took the samples and shipped them to Madison, where my good friend Ken Keepovering um, analyzed them using gas, chromat gas chromatography. And um, so here are some of our results. So what I'm showing you here are results from the three major terpenoid classes, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, and diterpenes. And um, on the left is the wound only, and on the right is the wound plus inoculation treatment. And as you can see, wounding does induce a response from all three classes. However, the local induced response is much stronger um, when it's exposed to both wounding and the mountain pine beetle fungi. Um, and then what's really interesting is that we see no systemic response. So studies have been showing, especially in European spruce, that these conifers tend to have a systemic response. But it doesn't look like we're seeing that much in this, um, in this species. Another interesting result was that we found relatively minor compositional changes, so in terms of individual compounds. And this is consistent with pine species. So spruce and fir tend to have much more um, biological um, or, I guess, compositional uh, variation with induced responses, and, and pine doesn't seem to have as much. I'm just going to point out one compound that was interesting. We saw a two-fold increase um, in uh, delta-3 carrying in both the wounding and the wound plus the inoculation. And this is important because this compound can be involved in um, uh, disrupting the aggregation pheromones that bark beetles are um, attracted to. And, the, and so this was an increase, but it was also at the expense of limonene, which is another really toxic compound to these uh, bark beetles. So the interaction between these compounds is, is really interesting. And finally, what we saw was that at the wounding site, the resin tends to be more viscous. So we calculate this looking at the ratio of mono and sesquiterpenes to diterpenes. And so if you have an increase in diterpenes, then your value is lower, which means that you have a higher viscosity. 
And so as you can see, both wounding and wound plus inoculation, so really the wounding treatment itself, is causing a compositional change between the classes that results in a much more viscous resin. And this can have extremely important implications for beetle progression, um, reducing the amount of the aggregate pheromone emissions, as well as allowing the tree a little bit more time to maybe induce some of those more toxic defenses. So in summary, what we see is um, a rapid local induction in all three of the dominant terpenoid groups with wounding. And we see that this, the mountain pine beetle fungus causes the greatest level of induction. And this is consistent with a lot of other studies. Um, we also see changes in resin composition and no systemic induction, but that wounding causes this higher viscosity resin. And like I said, can be really important for um, aggregate pheromone transmission. And so overall, what is Ponderosa's defense strategy? Well, it looks like they quickly overwhelm the invading beetles with this rapid induction of both chemical defenses in terms of upregulating total amounts, um, but also greater proportions of active terpenes. And also these physical defenses with this thicker resin, which can slow beetle movement um, and seal the wound really, really quickly. So I'm moving on <laughs> to the um, next two studies. So that was how herbivory is affecting um, plant chemistry, but now I want to talk about one study where we're looking at um, herbivory affecting plant chemistry both above ground and below ground. And instead of just focusing on foliar chemistry, we're going to talk about um, volatiles as well. And then the other study um, is looking at the effects of climate on plant secondary chemistry and what those um, changes might mean for herbivores. So both of these studies are really falling under the question of, you know, how do plants allocate carbon uh, to these defense compounds under different stresses. So we'll start with the first one where how does herbivory influence carbon allocation towards above and below ground terpene synthase or synthesis and emissions. And so recently we've seen a lot of work that's been interested in understanding the links between above ground and below ground processes. So a lot of us like to think of them as two <laughs> totally separate compartments, which is useful but they're actually very intricately um, linked. And so a lot of studies have really been focusing on the systemic impact of below ground herbivory on above ground volatiles and vice versa. So uh, for instance, this is a study done in 2013 where um, Pinus sylvestris was um, being fed upon by sawflies. And what they saw was an increase in the emissions above ground, but actually a decrease in total amount of terpene emissions as well as sesquiterpene emissions below ground, suggesting some sort of signaling between above ground um, and below ground defenses. And so what this is trying to highlight, as well as this little bit busy figure on the right, is that you know, um, foliar feeding organisms can really influence below ground plant defenses. But this is much less studied than the other way around. So a lot of studies are focusing on how mycorrhizal associations and below ground herbivory are affecting above ground signaling. And so we really see this as a gap in our knowledge. So the species that we're interested in emit monoterpenes as volatiles. And you can think of monoterpene emitting species as either storing or non-storing. Uh, so non-storing species tend to have this really um, tightly coupled connection between rates of synthesis and observed emissions. Whereas storing um, species like conifers, it was commonly assumed that emission rates typically come from this very large monoterpene pool. And so when we think about modeling these emissions, we tend to do them on a temperature-dependent um, algorithm. If anyone studies DOCs, and you're very familiar with Alex Gunther's algorithm that everybody uses to, um, <laughs> to model these emissions, assuming that the majority are coming from this stored pool. However, in 2010, uh, my good friend and colleague, Andrea Gerardo, uh, published this paper in uh, plant formal environment showing that this is actually not the case. So we can see that from his, this is um, a 13C labeling experiment that he did coupled with PTRMS. And if you're interested in PTRMS, I can talk more about that later. But what he's showing you here is that a significant fraction of monoterpene emissions actually do <laughs> originate from de novo synthesis. So we see a significant amount of recently assimilated carbon showing up in these emissions, particularly for Scotch pine and Norway spruce, where we see 58% to 33% um, coming from recently assimilated carbon. 
And of course, this is in comparison to non-soaring species, such as birch and home, home oak, where we see 80% is coming from recently assimilated carbon. But this is actually the maximum, because at steady state, we tend to only see about 80% um, total label because of these other carbon sources that can be used. So we wanted to use this very similar technique and ask the question, how does herbivory or simulated herbivory using methyl jasminate influence recently assimilated carbon allocation towards both above and below ground synthesis and emissions? And we did this using um, these two species of conifers, Norway spruce and fast pine. And so what I did was I moved my family to Germany for a half a year to work with this fine gentleman on the right, Yogi Schnitzler, who is an absolute joy to work with. I think people may be tentative to work with Germans, but he's awesome. And um, he is really fun. And this was, in the spirit of Halloween, I thought I would share my Halloween costume from last year, which was when I showed up to work one day and I was wearing the exact same outfit as my postdoc advisor and PhD advisor, which was <laughs> terrifying to me. So um, they got a kick out of it, but it scarred me for life. So. Um, Anyway, I've been working on this project with Yogi, and of course, um, Andrea Gerardo is a postdoc and now a permanent faculty member there. So we were working on this project together, and this is a little schematic of our experimental setup in terms of uh, the methyl jasminate application and sampling regime. And so I'm showing you sampling of shoots above and sampling of the roots below. And these arrows just indicate when we put um, GC cartridges onto samples. So a, a down arrow means I put it on. And up arrow means I took it off. So what you can see here is that we really only sampled above ground for two hours because the emissions were so high relative to below ground where the emissions are significantly lower. And we sampled for four hours. So what we did was we put these seedlings in above and below ground separate chambers, and we let them sit for 24 hours. And then what we did was um, the next morning we took volatile samples, both above and below ground. And then we sprayed the, the trees, but only the above ground portions, with methyl jasminate to simulate herbivory. So we put them back in the chambers, let them sit overnight. The next morning, we took another sample. And then in the afternoon, we labeled with um, 13C for six hours to reach steady state. Um, we were taking samples throughout the labeling. But most of the data that I'm showing you, actually, I think all of the data, are really comparing this time point 5, which is the peak of the labeling, um, versus time point 1, which is no label or methyl jasmine. And then the following day, we sampled once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And so how did this setup look? If you actually saw the real setup, it would be very scary. There's like a lot of tubes, and um, it looks frightening. And so this is a much cleaner way to just show you what we did. Basically, every week, we, um, we measured four trees, so two spruce and two pine, one control and one methyl jasmine every week. And, um, what we did was we had the above ground parts in, in a chamber, a Teflon bag, and then the below ground we measured at the soil air interface, and this is um, a, a custom made uh, cap for the, for the pot. Thank you. And um, so what we did was we were able to switch between 12 CO2 and 13 CO2 fairly easily. These red rectangles represent um, the cartridges for GCMS sampling. And then in addition to these point samples that we were taking for uh, the GCMS, we also had continuous PTRMS TOF data, which allows you to monitor trace gases in real time. And it also um, is really sensitive, which is, which is good for labeling. And it allowed us to confirm that we were reaching steady state with our labeling. Um, the other things that we, t we did in terms of sampling was we took needle samples at the peak of labeling very small for isotope analysis. And then we're also evaluating terpene synthase as well as sesquiterpene, or, uh, sesquiterpene synthase enzyme activity for above and below ground tissues. So what did we find? Or what are we finding, I should say? This is very much a work in progress. So what we're seeing so far is really just confirmatory induction of above ground terpenes in both spruce and pine in response to methyl jasmine. And this is not new. Um, this is, these are results from Diane Martin and her group. Um, and so as you can see, these are oxygenated monoterpenes and monoterpene hydrocarbons. And that's what I'm showing you here in this chromatogram as well. Um, this is just from spruce. And so the black line is at time point one. And you can barely see it, which is telling you that the constitutive levels are, are very low. 
but you can see at time point five, which is blue, and time point seven, which is red, we see significant levels of induction. Um, and we see that these levels are staying sustained for 24 to 48 hours, which again is um, consistent with what other people have seen in Norway spruce. But what's interesting is when we look at the labeling patterns. So what we tend to see is that the greatest incorporation of 13 um, is in these above ground oxygenated monoterpene emissions. So what I'm showing you here are, are the spruce and pine results for hydrocarbon monoterpenes, oxygenated monoterpenes, and sesquiterpenes. And so in both, in both species, we see that these more expensive oxygenated monoterpenes are actually um, the ones that have the greatest level of incorporation. And this might not be surprising when we look back at this slide and see that this peak here is linalool, which is an oxygenated monoterpene. And so there's really no emissions constitutively, but there are these huge induced emissions, which suggests that they're being produced primarily de novo. So obviously we see differences um, in the different classes, but we also see variation um, between compounds, even within classes. So above this red line are the oxygenated monoterpenes, and below are the hydrocarbons. And so you can see there's variation not just between the species, but um, even within the species and within the class, we see um, a lot of variation. And so this is something that we're looking into, especially in terms of how their, cyc their individual cyclase activities might be influencing the level of induction that we're seeing. Uh, so that's a lot about above ground, but what about below ground? So we also saw induction below ground. So what I'm showing you here is from a pine, and these are the below ground emissions. Again, the black is time point one, and then time point five is in the red. So we see, especially in alpha pinene and beta pinene, um, fairly high levels of induction below ground in response to above ground methyl jasminate treatment. And this is consistent with the enzyme data. So below is a chromatogram showing enzyme activity. And we see that the, the alpha pinene and the beta pinene enzymes are quite active. But what we also see is um, you know, this activation of linalool, but we don't see any linalool in our emission um, profile. So why might that be? So one possibility is that these soils may be acting as a sink, and so we can't actually, because we're measuring at the soil air interface, we may be measuring um, you know, in, in a very not ideal spot. We may need to do some more kind of rhizosphere um, type sampling. Uh, that's one explanation, and it's probably the best, but we're going to have to look into that a little bit more. Um, so our summary so far is that we're observing really high levels of induced VOCs above ground, which is, should be expected. But we see similar proportions of compound classes labeled among spruce and pine, albeit lower than the constitutive volatiles that Andrea was seeing in his experiment. So constitutively, he was seeing 30 to 60 percent of these emissions um, being created de novo, and we're only seeing anywhere between 15 and 20. So that suggests that herbivory is really changing these carbon allocation patterns. Um, we also see that the oxygenated monoterpenes are exhibiting the highest amount of incorporation, which could have to do with this, uh, the fact that there's really none produced constitutively, and they're all produced de novo as stress compounds. And we also see this incorporation into individual compounds as is quite variable. And this may have to do with these individual enzyme activities, and we're looking into that right now. And finally, induction below ground um, suggests that there's some sort of hormonal or chemical signal. And um, we actually have samples that we're looking at in terms of identifying that signal. But what's interesting is we don't see any 13C incorporation below ground, which could be that we're not waiting long enough or it could have something to do with enzyme activity and other carbon sources being used in the roots. So those are just some ideas that we have in terms of these, like I said, very preliminary data that um, I've been analyzing. So uh, finally, I want to talk about this last project that I'm uh, working on at Los Alamos, where we're looking at the influence of climate on carbon allocation towards plant defenses. And this question is really important and should be taken in the context of another question, which is why and where trees die. So uh, this is taken from one of Nate's papers, but is adapted from one of Craig Allen's papers. 
where we're showing that um, we're observing large-scale vegetation mortality across biomes um, globally. And this is in response to increases in drought, increases in temperature, increases in severity of drought, um, et cetera. And what we're expecting over the next few decades is that a lot of these plant communities are probably going to reach and or pass their mortality thresholds, uh, leading to uh, really important implications for climate, carbon storage, and other ecosystem services. So this is a really important topic. Um, and so the factors that lead to tree mortality in general, like biotic agents, droughts, uh, carbon starvation, those are all really well known. But we don't have a good sense of how these factors are interacting, especially at the mechanistic level. And therefore, it's been really challenging to parameterize um, these dynamic global vegetation models, which any modeler will probably agree with me. And so um, over the past decade or so, various mortality mechanisms have been suggested independently. So anyone who's familiar with this literature knows about the carbon starvation hypothesis versus the hydraulic failure hypothesis. But when we set it up like that, it's really a false dichotomy because these processes are intimately linked. So for instance, we know that hydraulic failure can promote carbon starvation, and carbon starvation then can promote further hydraulic failure. So um, there's been efforts more recently to really integrate these um, hypotheses and these mechanisms into a larger framework of understanding mortality. But our gap really lies in our need to integrate defense and biotic agents into this framework. So on the right here, what I'm showing you are um, a number of hypotheses in terms of these mortality mechanisms and how they interact potentially with one another. And um, poor defense and biotic agents are at the bottom here. And um, we've really struggled to be able to say anything about how carbon may be differentially allocated under different climate scenarios to defenses. So how does one go about doing this? Well, the best way to tease apart these various mechanisms is to work in a manipulative um, experiment uh, preferably with mature trees and preferably with really nice guys like Nate and Henry, who I'm showing you here. Um, so they've been kind enough to let me, this homeless-looking girl here in the picture, come in and uh, do some work in their uh, open-top chambers, which uh, we're all like trapped in a nutshell, it looks like, in this, in this picture. But anyway, um, we're working at this site called SUMO, which stands for Survival and Mortality at the Los Alamos National Lab. Um, this is run by Nate and um, his group there on a very generously funded DOE grant. Um, basically, it consists of these below canopy rainout structures that can divert 45% of the precipitation away from these plants. They have 18 transparent open top chambers with regulated heating and cooling. So basically, when you see those huge air conditioning systems for one large building. They basically have one of those for every chamber. It's crazy. Um, and this allows us to have um, five different treatments, just drought, uh, heat, which is um, giving us an increase of approximately 4.8 degrees Celsius, um, drought plus heat, ambient, and ambient control. And since the inception of this project in June of 2012, they've been doing these monthly intensives where they go out and they're um, taking every physiological uh, measurement possible, so photosynthesis, conductance, water potential, non-structural carbohydrates, et cetera. And then I just tacked on a couple of extra things um, to have them sample needles and twigs so that I could get an idea of how secondary chemistry has been changing uh, in this system over time. So what did we really know about allocation to secondary defenses before we started, especially monoterpenes. Well, since the 90s, we've known that drought stress alters monoterpene concentrations, specifically in seedlings and potted plants. And we've known that under moderate drought, as you can see here, we tend to see an increase in monoterpene concentrations, both in the wood and in the needles. Um, and so that, that's been pretty well known. But then this recent paper came out, um, again, by Monica Gaylord um, and this group at, at Arizona, and it says drought predisposes pinion juniper woodlands to insect attacks and mortality. 
And yes, it, indeed it does. However, the mechanism behind which this is um, happening is really unknown. And a lot of it probably, we think, has to do with chemistry. And so given these um, observations, my question was really, well, what are the effects of prolonged drought and heat on terpene production in mature trees um, at SUMO? And so I'm going to show you some of the results. Um, this is total terpene concentration in um, four of the treatments at SUMO. And what you can see here is that the heat treatment in terms of total concentration is not different from trees that are exposed to ambient conditions, which may be surprising. Um, not surprisingly, we see that drought actually tends to increase concentration. But what's really interesting is this interaction between heat and drought. So heat actually tends to exacerbate the effect of drought on total terpene concentrations um, in the system, which is something that hasn't really been shown before, especially in mature trees. So um, we see differences in treatments, but we also see that these differences vary by compound, which is like should be like my motto somewhere, always individual compound differences. Um, and so they, they vary by compound, but also isomers. And that's really kind of amazing to me since they share such a um, similar biosynthetic pathway. So for instance, what we see here in terms of camping, um, under the heat treatment, we see a decrease in, this, in the concentration of this compound. But in the ambient drought and heat plus drought, there's no difference. Whereas in 3-delta carrying, we see no difference by treatment. And in um, the two isomers of limonene, we see very different patterns. So um, another really interesting result from this study is that not only do we see elevated concentrations in drought and heat plus drought, but we see that these trends tend to be sustained over a relatively long period of time, about two and a half years. And so um, this red arrow here is showing you when the experiment started in um, June of 2012. And you can see by the end of the year, there's already these really strong treatment effects and that those treatment effects are extremely long lasting. And this is even more surprising when you look at the instantaneous water potential. So these trends tend to persist despite the fact that we have these huge um, amounts of variation in the instantaneous water status or water potential of the plant, which says to me that instantaneous water potential is not a good predictor of concentration and that something may be happening at the beginning where these trees are reaching and passing a threshold and investing in these defenses over a longer period of time. So what we're doing is we're looking into better cumulative metrics to try and understand or um, correlate some of these patterns that we're seeing. And so what I'm showing you up here on the top right is, again, the graph that I already showed you with total amount of terpene concentration. And then um, these are some data from a postdoc who's working down at Los Alamos, Charlotte, of delta 13C. And what can, you can see here, which is a very integrated um, value, and what you can see here is in the heat, heat by drought, we see that they're the most enriched. Um, they have the most 13C enriched tissues, which is consistent under drought stress. And this pattern that we're seeing is really consistent across treatments with um, our terpene concentration data. We're also looking into the possibility that changes in anatomy and architecture could be accounting for a lot of the patterns that we're seeing in terms of this long-term sustained um, concentration data. So um, I've talked a lot with Ken Rafa and Nate and, and people about this. And, and it could be that we're just uh, seeing an increase in production due to resin canal structure and anatomy. And so we have all of these samples, and so we're looking to see if um, we can correlate some of these changes in anatomy with uh, these changes in concentration. And so, in summary, so far, is um, you know we're seeing carbon allocation towards total monoterpene concentration in the needles um, increasing under drought stress, but they're increasing even more with this heat addition to the drought stress. And so I'm showing a lot of, all of these data are from the needles, but you know, we can't say anything about total defenses just by looking at one plant tissue. So we're also looking at the, the woody tissues to look at um, phloem and xylem uh, levels to see if those are consistent with these patterns. And then we're also looking at these communities of herbivores uh, 
that may or may not be affected by this change in chemistry. So we have funnel traps out there at the site, and um, we can really try and correlate the arrival of some of these um, different guilds of herbivores with changes in chemistry. We're also seeing that carbon allocation is varying by compound and even between isotopes, and this again may have something to do with differential up or down regulation of enzyme activity. Um, we see increased levels of monoterpenes that are observed over multiple years, and again, this may have something to do with the anatomy. And we think that cumulative rather than instantaneous metrics may be providing better correlates um, to look at these different patterns. So, Future directions, um, we really think that these data are, are interesting, and so we're proposing um, to continue work in the system with an, an NSF proposal that's coming up here. <laughs> um, and our hope is to really advance um, general carbon allocation theory in, this, in terms of this mortality framework. And so to do that, we're going to be including um, other carbon-based defenses that are also found in the phloem, the xylem, as well as the volatiles that these plants are losing to the atmosphere. Um, another major goal is to identify threshold responses. So at what point does the status of the plant, in terms of its chemistry, physiology, et cetera, translate into attraction and attack by various biotic agents? So anyone who studies bark beetles will tell you you know, we really don't know anything about these signals that um, pioneering beetles are using to find their host plants. And that's very similar for a lot of other herbivores as well. And so we're hoping that by correlating the arrival and success of some of these herbivores with these threshold responses, we may be able to uh, glean some insight on that. And finally, we hope to improve these dynamic global vegetation models by including physiological feedbacks that include defense and also include this insect perspective. So there's, um, there's a gentleman at Atlas Elmos who's really interested in trying to incorporate insects and insect host choice into these models. And so he's going to be working on um, part of this project with us. So if you're just paying attention now, <laughs> these are the highlights <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> this is my highlight reel. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that ponderosas in general have the potential to quickly overwhelm bark beetles with locally induced chemical changes and physical changes um, in, with respect to their resin. Um, in the project that I've been doing with the OU's group, we see that simulated above ground herbivory is inducing VOCs both above and below ground, and we see there is no incorporation below ground, but we see substantial um, de novo synthesis in especially the oxygenated monoterpenes above ground. And finally, um, in this work that I've been doing at Los Alamos, we see that heat can exacerbate drought-induced increases in total monoterpene concentrations in pinion pine, and that this effect can be sustained over long periods of time in spite of fluctuating instantaneous water potential or the water status of the trees. So hopefully you found that interesting and have some questions. We have 15 minutes for questions. I'm like, right on time, Kathy. So, um, so thanks for your attention, and I'll take questions now. Yeah, Dave. How does methyl, what's it, stimulate herbivory? Uh, it's a plant, so methyl jasonate is a plant hormone that um, in response to actual herbivory tends to be upregulated and part of the jasmonic acid signaling pathway um, that induces chemical changes in the plant. So without actually physically, um, you know, or mechanically damaging, we sprayed that on to, to simulate herbivory in, in terms of the chemical signaling that, that you see. So yeah, I didn't really explain that. Thanks for pointing that out, Dave. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm worried about Right, right. No, I mean, it's a great question, and um, there's really no easy answer because 
you know, how much recently assimilated carbon is going into defenses or other process, other processes is really species dependent. It's dependent on phenology, dependent on, you know, environmental conditions, et cetera. Um, you know, people have shown, especially with these volatile um, defenses, like isoprene and monoterpenes, that a relatively substantial amount of carbon can be invested into them, particularly isoprene. And so um, in terms of, you know, looking at how carbon is being allocated to defense versus mycorrhizae versus non-structural carbohydrates, I mean, that's, that's really what, that's the question we're, we're trying to ask. And one approach is, is this labeling technique, but the other approach is really looking at, um, you know, total carbon. So, you know, you're going to have to harvest these plants and look at how much carbon is going into below ground, uh, you know, roots and mycorrhizae. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially <laughs> in mature trees. So um, your point is really valid, and, and, it's a, and it's a definite limitation, especially understanding the allocation to below ground um, processes, which is why there's this huge gap in the literature looking at that, and that's why we're only using seedlings where we can destructively harvest. And actually, I didn't discuss this, but part of that work with Yogi um, is looking at the effect of ecomycorrhizal associations on defenses, and um, I just didn't have time to talk about that, but that's something that just even the presence of mycorrhizae and having to um, expend carbon is something that we're interested in. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer, and we're trying to kind of couple these different techniques to, to get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, Kathy. How long does it take for a response to be local to become systemic? So you said you were away for a couple weeks. couple weeks, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it is. I mean, is it well, it's longer, a, but does it happen right away? Or? We were at flux course. We were at flux course, yeah. <laughs> um, you mean just in the, in the ponderosa pine? I mean, really, the most of the study, the other studies that have done something very similar have also done kind of this like two week um, window. So I can't the ones that I'm aware of, and so I don't know how that trajectory, you know, like how I was showing for the needles, like those increases over time. I don't know really how that looks. Maybe Justin, you have any thoughts on that? Actually, plenty of time. I guess they respond. <clears throat> other like plants respond within hours. Right. Of their response, and I would guess if you're a ponderosa pine, you attack that beetle, you probably need to respond quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's, um, I mean, we're talking about ponderosa, but in different species, yeah, I mean, especially like in the needles versus, you know, the phloem, you can see very different timing of responses. You can see very big differences in terms of when that, the peak of the response is, um, is being observed and stuff. But yeah, I mean, again, we, this response is probably very, very quick. Mm -hmm. Structurally, it, it was right across from the infection, you, you tested it right laterally. Like yeah, so you know, at one... Uh, could, could you be missing, could the, the systemat, systemic plants be down? Yeah, I mean, that was um, something that we had talked about, too, that maybe, yeah, you have to go off before you go back down. Uh, but, you know, we, we just don't know. We didn't, you know, it's like, yeah, you can't sample these guys forever and keep damaging them, but it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible that we could see a systemic response and we're just not waiting long enough. I mean, some plants you see these really long-term systemic responses. Um, so it's a possibility for sure. Yeah? With the gesmonic acid treatment, do you have an idea of what, uh, I guess, the concentration or numbers of herbivores it would be correspond to. Did you apply a really high density mm. herbivore to the plant or mm. low density treatment? Yeah, so um, ours would be, that's a really great question because um, as he's pointing out, the severity of, of your herbivore attack can really affect the induced response. This would be like a, a moderate to severe, I would say. Um, I mean, we weren't like overloading them with methyl jasmine. It's a pretty consistent dose with what other people have given, but to simulate moderate to severe defoliation. Yeah, mm -hmm. great question. So yeah, which would ac account for these really high levels of induction that we're, that we're seeing, particularly with these stressed um, VOCs like linalool and the other oxygenated monotherpenes. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. So that was kind of leading to a, a question I had as well with Thunder of Time. In, in those cases where you had an injury, one, right, mm -hmm. would it be more likely to be systemic if, if there were multiple injuries? Um, I don't, I mean, do you, yeah, it's like, who knows? <laughs> um, the systemic responses are really pretty tricky from, I mean, at least that's what I would categorize them as. I mean, like I said, they, they can have these significant time lags, so you really don't know when, when you might see that response. But, um, yeah, I mean, you would imagine maybe that if you're being attacked by multiple beetles that your overall induction is going to be maybe higher, and you might see that in other parts of the tree. On the other hand, um, if you have a lot of beetles that are attacking, you could be depleting those defenses really fast. You could be kind of putting them all in these really quick localized responses and therefore not have enough resources or not have the ability to mount the systemic response. So I think both are possible, and we just don't, we don't really know. Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, about that, right? So one of the reasons for that criminal protocol is compared against the logical studies that already been done. Mm -hmm. Something we've never talked about is right. The ponderosa has done very well. Also does the bark. Mm -hmm. uh, logical defense kind of medium well, but do white bark do anything? I mean, they defend very poorly, but do they even try or? <laughs> <laughs> do they even put any effort <laughs> into it? Clearly, they don't do a good job of it. Is there like any? Do they have any response, or is anyone supposed to that? Paul, you should, we live together, you should know that I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't you ask me this last night? <laughs> no, I'm curious too. I really, I really don't know. I mean, <laughs> we can talk more over dinner. I don't know. <laughs> no, differences between um, defense strategies with Lodgepole and Ponderosa are, are pretty striking. Um, I mean, in ter just in terms of overall chemical composition, um, where we see, you know, that the lodgepole have significantly less amounts of limonene, um, which is extremely toxic, and ponderosa has a lot of limonene. We see um, differences in beta phalandrine, which can be an important chiromone. Um, we see, I think I was telling you, the, just the overall induction of um, diterpene acids in ponderosa is on the scale of like 340 milligrams per gram, whereas in lodgepole, they're only induced like 14 milligrams per gram. So levels of induction, overall composition is very different, which, you know, may contribute to, to the patterns that we see in, in attacks. But, I mean, obviously, like I've, I've said before, these plants are vicious creatures, and they, they you know, really mount these very strong defenses, but they're still being, um, you know, we still see these epidemic um, densities, so they're overcoming them somehow. Yeah? I don't know if they, do you think there may be implications of your finding for management beyond just for helping trees? Yeah. Great question, because I just talked with them. Um, and a solo yesterday, and um, we've been talking about looking at these genetic bioenvironmental interactions and how they're influencing monoterpene production. Um, she's working in like Lubrex and Condon and another area um, where they have these genetic trials, and so the timber industry is really interesting and interested in selecting for these fast-growing um, ponderosas, obviously. But uh, what they're finding are some really interesting interactions between um, growth and survival with bark beetles in terms of resin production and monoterpenes and stuff. And so um, it's, it's definitely, you know, we're, we're wondering if by selecting for these faster growing trees, if we're actually selecting for trees that may be more susceptible to um, any type of herbivore bark beetle attack as well. So it's a great question and it's something that we're interested in, especially looking at these different genotypes and because um, we know that chemistry varies significantly by by genotypes so yeah there are I think to answer your question is yes you know we do think there are some some management um, implications for this type of work yes yeah, building on that um, in the areas where there has been significant mortality uh, has anyone kind of looked to see you know, are there survivors and do they show different levels of response and Great question. Yeah, so actually Anna um, 
and her colleague Sharon Hood have a paper that just came out I think in tree physiology earlier this month that is looking at exactly that where they looked at um, surviving trees and dead trees in terms of um, they were looking mostly at uh, resin canal production so density area all of that stuff and they've, they've been looking at those types of correlations and they see that trees that um, that survive tend to have a greater density of, of resin canals of these traumatic resin ducts that they produce but not necessarily bigger in size but just the, the overall density so yeah I mean that's we are seeing and, and, and that's something that we're building on too is that we see differences in resin canal structure but can that really translate to um, you know our knowledge on the actual chemical defenses and the answer is really no because um, Monica Gaylord she's shown that under um, drought stress they see differences um, they'll see differences in resin canal structure but not in terms of attack and so you know it could have something to do more with the chemistry than the resin canals or they could be related it really I think depends on the species and and the conditions so yeah Another thing where <laughs> these are like all of my future projects <laughs> flashing before my eyes. <laughs> so um, yeah, Stephanie. Yeah, you know, it kind of raises a question about patients where you have high marks from people compared to more response, or among species that have had that deep or that kind of thing. Where do you know that on real time? Yeah, I mean, I mean, especially like I was saying, like with lot, like just comparing lodgepole and ponderosa, like you know we. Lodgepole is their historic and, and most common host, but their defense system relative to ponderosa is, it seems so minimal, you know what I mean? But then you also have to consider that these two species, this bark beetle and this tree, have co-evolved together over time. And so there is this, you know, there's this unique relationship that it's very hard to account for when you're trying to say something on a larger scale. You know, it's like, how do you account for this historic relationship and this like this, these adaptations over time and so um, I mean it's something that we've been thinking about Ken and I have talked about applying for money to the USDA to look at a question very similar to that and I'm really not a bark beetle expert and so I don't I, I don't want to like go too far out of bounds on answering these questions but you know it seems that there's just this historic component that's really hard to quantify mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you so much.